Okay, uh, let's go ahead and knock this out. So a positive change in enthalpy means what? A positive change in enthalpy is an increase. Yes. Um, increase in energy. It's going to need to be more specific. Uh, energy being added to the system. Oh, but I don't. I don't mind that. So positive delta H is what we would end up having. So in this case. We're talking about a chemical reaction. Reactants have less energy than the products do. All right, how about a positive entropy change? Uh, chaos is being added to the system? Sure. So negative delta, sorry, positive delta S. And nature, it's nature's situation with this. Nature is unhappy when there is order and happy when there is just chaos. Okay, so in this case, since I'm increasing the amount of chaos, nature's happy with that, right? And it is unhappy that the system has gained energy. So um, it's looking for a negative delta H and it's, it's getting a positive delta H. Everybody good with that? Okay, so we're gonna do this calculation. First thing we need to do is add 273 to this. We'll get 290 to 88k. So delta G is equal to 2.4, actually I'll do 2,400 joules per mole. Minus uh, 288k and um, 56 joules per mole. K. K cancels, end up with joules per mole. Uh, 2400 minus 288 times 56. Oh, that's a multiplication sign. Minus. So this is uh, negative one three seven two eight joules. So spontaneous, yes. So spontaneous just means it's negative, or the end result is negative, right? Yep. Okay. Just a combination of what's happening with the energy and what's happening with the entropy. Okay. All right, so we want to calculate the delta G. All right, so I'm going to need text. And sorry, what are we looking for? Calcium carbonate, CO2, and calcium oxide. So here. So calcium 
oxide. Now, so we're looking for H and G. So we're looking for S. So first and last. This looks like uh, negative 634.9 and 38.1. And calcium carbonate, negative 1220 and 110. And the other one was CO2. Oh, that was convenient. Negative 393.51 and 2138. Alrighty, let's go back over here. So we need to do uh, a summation uh, for H's and a summation for the S's, and we need to do it for final and initial. So the C, sorry, the second C O um, C A. O and CO2 and CACO3. Okay, so we need um, products. So H, delta H is going to be negative 2 or 393.51 plus negative 634.9 minus 1200. Are we okay with these numbers? This is my CO2, this is my CO, and this is my CaCO3. And these are all in, in uh, kilojoules per mole. So I end up with, what do I get here? Uh, negative 393.5 plus negative 634.9 minus 1220. Sorry, minus negative 1220. So this is 191.6 kilojoules per mole. And there's my delta H, and my delta S. So we've got uh, 213.8 and 38.1. And then we started off with 110. So 213.8 plus 38.1 minus 110. So 141.9. So. One ninety one point six uh, those were kilojoules and joules, right? That's I what I think the delta S is in joules and the uh, Yeah, the S is in joules and the the enthalpy is in um, kilojoules. So let's do this. Like this, I'll do. I say one one forty. No, one ninety one six zero zero joules per mole. Minus. Uh, dang it! Did it say two ninety eight? That figures. It's got the degree symbol, so in the textbook it does say two ninety eight. Yeah, the, the little degree symbol was would be two ninety eight k, and then this is going to be one forty one point nine joules per mole k. So that cancels. All right, so then we've got. One nine one six zero zero 
minus 298 times 141.9. It's a really big number. I guess we should have gone with the kilojoules. So this became four five nine three one four four joules per mole, or we can say it's one hundred and forty nine point three kilojoules per mole. And then, since this is a positive value, then this reaction is non spontaneous. Does that look good? Does anybody have any questions about any of those? Um, yeah. The, the, the number in the railroad equation, the very last one, does that say, hold on, does that say 298, 2981K or 298K? 298K. Does it matter if we were on a test, like which way we wrote it, if we wrote it in joules or kilojoules, as long as we have the right type of reaction? Well, you're given the answer, right? So you just pick whichever one's right. I'm not going to, I would never give you these as your options. Yeah, that would be rude. That would be super jerkish because you wouldn't know which one to use because one of them yeah. started in joules and one of them started in kilojoules. So yeah, you, you, you could be... Um, feel free to be upset if that, if that was happening to I you. Totally, I totally forgot that we're on, we're doing multiple choice now. Anything else with this? Are you guys good with this? Right. So we'll um, switch over to electric chem. We're having our tests like next week, right? We are? I think so. I mean, or maybe two weeks from now, but I, I checked the uh, the syllabus and it was like pretty close. Looks like next week, yeah. Uh, Valentine's Day, because I know none of Allison. you are going anywhere. Allison, no, our exam grades are not final. They're still going to be changed. Yeah, no, I haven't I haven't fixed that yet. I have a meeting Friday to talk with people about that. Okay, so last class we were talking about electrochem, and we ended talking about that. We talked about analogies between electricity and water the pressure being the voltage and the amount of flow or amperage being more like um, uh, like the size of the pipe. Um, the Columbia River has a huge amperage, but a very low voltage. And a pressure washer has a very low amperage, but a very high voltage. So both of those can, um, can, uh, can be modified depending on what your situation is. And we discussed the voltages being pretty high on in, in some parts and, and not so high in other parts. It's 110, 120 coming out of the wall. It's uh, like 440 coming down from the line to your house. And then your house splits it into a 220 voltage circuit and a 120 voltage circuit or a 110 voltage circuit. Does anybody know what the voltages are for the electricity that gets sent from, say, the Dow's Dam to Los Angeles? Uh, well, I mean, it's coming straight. The energy is coming straight from the dam, right? So wouldn't it be pretty high? That doesn't have anything to do with it. All of the, you, you can step the electricity's voltage up and down anywhere along the way. So it's being transferred to California. So long distance, right? We talked about yeah. this being a thing. Maybe a better color. I can wear less. So what that is, is as the electricity runs through the wire, it produces a kind of friction that results in heat. So 
what this is dependent upon is the amount of amperage, so the number of electrons passing a point in a given time, and the resistance of the body in which they're traveling through. So these are giant copper conductors. So the resistance is nominal. It, it's, it stays for whatever it is, because that's what we're using. But what about the current? Does it slow down or? Um, no, the speed doesn't change, but what I can do is reduce the number of electrons passing a point and still have the same amount of power. So does anybody know how that works? Sheen should know how that works. She knows everything. Well, Sheen is sort of doing yeah. some of that. Um, yeah, but um, the way it works is the increase in voltage is proportional to the uh, decrease in uh, amperage and vice versa, depending on which way you're going. As long as they stay the same though in power, you can. it's the same as like we did with the uh, pressure. If I remember correctly with like the relation of if the pressure, the number of molecules and the volume of the container, right? So something to, to know is V and E for some, for, well, for language reasons, both mean voltage. They're both the symbol for voltage. V is obvious, but E isn't obvious to us. But E is actually the symbol that most electricians use for the amount of voltage in an object. P is power, and I is current, and E is voltage. And if I'm sending electricity to California, the power number stays the same. So what happens if I jack the voltage up? to a really high level. Power increases? No, power can't increase. Power is set in stone. So then I decreases? So current goes down. So when so we transfer- I represent current? Yes. Okay. So when, when we send electricity to California, to make sure that we don't have, we don't lose a bunch of power to this I squared R loss thing, basically to lose it to heat, we increase the voltage to a very high level, like 50,000 volts. And what that does is it reduces the current down to a very low quantity. So what happens is we send less electrons to California, but every single one of them had, packs a seriously huge punch. And then when those electrons get there, they take the voltage and step it down to a usable level. Does that make sense? That's why the high, high tension power lines that go to California are so damn high off the ground. Like regular power poles are like 20, 30 feet off the ground. I mean, sometimes it's dangerous for a big truck to drive underneath sagging power lines, right? That's never gonna happen with the high tension power lines. Those guys are 60 feet, 100 feet off the ground because they don't want them anywhere near the ground because if they did, they could produce lightning bolts. They could jump from high voltage down to the ground. Is that is this uh, equation supposed to represent like power is equal to volts multiplied by uh, current? That is exactly what it's equal to. Yeah. So it's uh, it's easy to remember if you understand I is current and E is voltage because then it's just pi, right? It always comes back to pi. It does. Pi trumps cake every time. <laughs> does it? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Of course it does. Actual fruit? Yeah, but I really like a chocolate cake. Um, you can have chocolate pie. That's true, there are chocolate pies. I won't give you that. But there are also fruit cakes, but those are really good. Mm, that, that, that's, that's not a, yeah, those are, that's a misnomer. That's yeah. not an actual cake, right? Anything that doesn't have... But there can be fruit in cake, is what I'm saying. And it can be good. That's fine. Cake. Sure. The yum yum cake? I worked at a bakery when I was an undergrad and they made high end cakes, like cakes that were fancy, fancy, but they were also like $30 a cake. They were huge. God. And uh, yeah, really they ran out of something. And so I suggested that they use their raspberry filling with peanut butter and they made a peanut butter and jelly cake. The frosting on the outside was peanut butter. And they're like, <laughs> that'll never work. And they sold one and then they were selling like a dozen a week at $30 a piece. And they're like, all right, fine. It was pretty funny. Did you funny. get a promotion? I washed dishes. What kind of promotion do you get? Yeah. Okay. We make a good yum no. yum cake. No. Um, okay, so.
Think about what life would be without electricity. Think about what happens to you when power goes out of your house. Some of you are incredibly ill prepared for that. Some of you are like, man, it's not that big a deal. I've got lamps and uh, I've got kerosene and uh, I've got candles and I've got books. So totally depends on your situation. Or maybe some of you have solar panels and um, a Tesla wall in your house. So a Tesla wall. A wall of Tesla. It's a it's a wall of it's a wall of batteries. It's a giant battery pack. <laughs> so they're um, that's that's um that's going to be a thing here going forward, especially with the rest with the rest of the planet. A big deal with the coronavirus is a lot of planets are or a lot of countries are saying, all right, well we um, we're going to change the economy so we don't use coal anymore. We don't use fossil fuels anymore. There was an Australian study that came out and said if we switched everything over to solar and wind and then bought everybody's uh, gas-powered vehicle and, and sold them a, uh, an electric car, that everybody would save $1,000 a year in just period. They'd have an extra $1,000. Um, plus, things would be nice. Like I'm sure you've seen many of those pictures and or videos of rivers that have been all of a sudden they're not polluted anymore. Parks that just are clean. Like uh, the one that gets me the most is Venice, since yeah. obviously the city's in the middle of water. And you can see the bottom of the canals now. You haven't been able to see the bottom of the canals in 50 years. It's just there, clean. There are wildlife back in the uh, canals of the canal. No, I've seen, I like to see the, the videos of like completely empty streets and like her like a like a family of you know 15 boar just like running down the middle of the road i heard that um a bunch of elephants saw that there were people in the village because they were all at home and so they came out and they had a bunch of like i think it was like peanut wine or some weird kind of wine and they all got drunk and passed out in the like in the fields and in the gardens i can't remember where it was but it was so funny to watch it really sounds fictitious, but it was in like a tea garden in India. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, there were actually like photos of elephants just chilling, like just absolutely wasted. Okay, <laughs> I'm gonna have to look that up. Yeah, there's some weird, especially in the really industrialized area. It's like smog, no smog. Right. <laughs> it's magic. I wonder how that happens. <sighs> okay, so. We can talk about the way electricity gets created in several different ways. We're gonna talk about a, a different way when we get to nuclear power. But right now we're just gonna talk about DC as far as batteries go, because that's what this section of the notes in this, uh, this chapter is about. Um, so that, that's another thing. Having no electricity in your house is one thing, but what if you, what if you got rid of all the batteries in your house or that you use? Uh, well, then you have to charge it with the kind of batteries. If batteries are gone, then we wouldn't have like. Unless you're talking about like taking out batteries with literally everything. And... Yeah, that's just what I'm saying. Like, if batteries weren't a thing, we would be kind of tied down, right? Extension cords yeah, for everything. Cords, right? yeah. I mean, do any of you still have a drill that plugs into the wall? Oh no, that's weird to me. Ugh. Is there a, <laughs> it, it, a no, okay, so let me rephrase that. A non-concrete drill that plugs into the wall? Because I could see you using a concrete drill that's still plugged yeah, into the wall. One. Is this a concrete drill? More RPM. No, yeah. that's definitely not a concrete drill. <laughs> you would not be wielding the concrete drill with one hand nonchalantly. Unless you were Mark Wahlberg or uh, <laughs> yeah, who was the other guy? I just bought a grinder and I had a choice between a nine thousand RPM hand battery pack or a fifteen thousand RPM. Obviously, you gotta go with the fifteen. Exactly. It'll change soon, but it'll be a while. Uh, okay, so real accounts run by just air pressure. Sure, but how do you charge the air pressure? Um, in my shop, there is a massive 
I need to go through it because it's totally got thin spots in it, but it's a cast iron tube that runs probably 70 feet long in a diameter of, I'd say, at least six inches. It's absurdly heavy. Sounds absurdly heavy. Okay, so um, batteries. So how is it that a battery works? These are redox reactions. We talked about redox reactions before when we were talking about types of reactions. Does somebody want to give us a quick what happens in a redox reaction? I'm pretty sure the, the O, the oxygen is replaced. No, um, nothing to do with oxygen. There's a gain and a loss of electrons. There's a transfer of electrons. The electron moves from one substance to another substance. When we're talking about batteries, we usually talk about the fact that this is happening with a metal. It could be between two metals, could be between a metal and an organic something or other, but it's um, um, about transferring of electrons. So this is reduction, and then this is oxidation. And so when reduction and oxidation occurs, Let's uh, erase this for a second. That didn't change that. Why aren't you allowing me to click that? What's going on? Okay. Is that working? All right, there we go. Uh, I don't know what's going on with this. That's frustrating. Huh. I'm going to turn that off for a sec and turn that back on. Did that help? Yep, that helped. Okay, so if I've got hydrogen and I've got oxygen and I make a water molecule, what's the oxidation state for the hydrogen here? Zero, yeah, you're right. Oxygen, zero, right? Because these are both elements in their elemental form, right? So these are atoms. What about over here? The hydrogen's charge is a plus one, the oxygen's charge is a minus two. So what happened? The hydrogen took its one electron and gave it to one of the oxygens. The hydrogen gave its other electron to that same, uh, the other hydrogen gave its electron to that oxygen. There's two sets of hydrogens and you end up making two sets of water molecules. So who was reduced and who was oxidized in this reaction? The H's were reduced. No, they weren't. Oh. Great, because it's electrons. Reduced, I, I totally get what you're saying. So when you say reduced, you're thinking, okay, it lost something or it gained something. You're yeah. not being helpful. <laughs> You're phenomenally distracting. Uh, it, it, um... So when we say reduce, we're not talking about reduce the number of electrons. We're talking about what? <laughs> this charge was reduced. It was zero and it dropped to negative two, where this charge went up. So this guy is... So when we're talking about batteries, we're talking about a substance that loses electrons and another substance that gains electrons. And that's what happens when the battery discharges. And then what happens when the battery is recharged? It gains those electrons back. Yeah, the, the element or the substance that lost the electrons gains those back. So if we were to take this water molecule and turn this back into hydrogen, hydrogen, and oxygen, we would have reversed the redox reaction and put the electrons back on the hydrogen and stop. You, you gotta go outside. Thanks. Oh, redox means reduction and oxidation. I totally forgot. <laughs> so this, um, this usually happens when we're talking about uh, metals, when we're talking about batteries, but doesn't have, not always. So again, um, if I, if I'm an atom and I lose electrons, I was oxidized. If I'm an atom and I gained electrons, I was reduced. And can somebody remind everybody why it was called oxidation?
What? Only when we discovered it weren't all of the uh, known cases of this done with oxygen. That's it. When they were checking metals and the metals lost their electrons, they asked, well, what is the substance that's taking the electrons away? And the answer was oxygen. So what they were observing is oxygen rusting different metals, which makes sense for what reason? Can you give me two reasons? One, oxygen is everywhere, right? 20% of the atmosphere. How about another reason? I'll give you a number. And I'll tell you that that number is number two. Electronegativity. That's the electronegativity number. The number one number is four or 3.9, and that's fluorine. But there isn't a lot of fluorine in the atmosphere, so they didn't call it fluoridation because they weren't seeing fluorine do this. But if fluorine and oxygen were in the same container with, say, aluminum, the fluorine would win and be stealing the electrons away from the aluminum. But since oxygen is everywhere, it's oxygen doing what we see. So when we see regular rust, we are, we're watching oxygen take those electrons away. So initially, they're like, hey, every time these substances lose electrons, it's because of oxygen being around. You're doing it right this second. How? We're breathing? Well, that's incidental to this. I was going to ask, isn't there more nitrogen than there is oxygen in the atmosphere? Yeah, but nitrogen is not reactive. Okay. I mean, you're doing all of this right here, right? So what are you doing to the carbon dioxide, or sorry, what are you doing to the glucose? We're breaking it down for energy. Um, relative to our conversation right here. We are. So are we. <laughs> You're oxidizing sugar. So in a not really the correct term, you're rusting sugar. Okay. If rusting is taking electrons away from something, that's what the oxygen is doing to the, to the glucose. So you're, you, you perform this tiny little battery reaction inside of each of your cells to rejuvenate the ATP of the oxygen taking the electrons away from the carbon atoms. We go with that. So then, what would we say about the oxygen? Would it be reduced? The oxygen is being reduced because let's let's prove that the oxygen's oxidation state in respiration is a zero because it's an element in its elemental stage. What is its charge over here in the carbon dioxide? It's minus two. What is it in the water? It's minus two. So all of the product oxygens have gained two electrons. And all of the reactant oxygens that are important to us, these guys here, they, um, they had zero charge, they were atoms, and so they're out there grabbing electrons away from carbons and hydrogens, or basically just the carbons. We good with that? Okay. All right, so... Just as like a rehashing, what has happened to this potassium? It's gaining a charge. Uh, I so don't like the way you said that. Now, maybe you are understanding what's going on, but can you say that a different way? Because I don't, I don't like the word gain. Can somebody say why the word gain is a bad, bad term? It's losing an electron. It's losing an electron, which makes its charge go up to become more positive. So there's no gaining happening with the potassium. Something, something is gaining. What's gaining? What is, what is gaining the electron? 
Yeah, whatever took it. Whatever took it, exactly. Whatever took it is gaining the electron. And that's totally fine. And I'm, I am sharing that screen, aren't I? Yeah, we can see it. Okay, good. For some reason for a second, I thought I wasn't. Um, out of the way. Okay. Are you, wait, are you recording the lesson? Yeah, see, can you guys see this thing down here in the bottom left-hand corner? No, is that... wait, one of my little scroll bars is up, but I guess I can't really see it. You guys try the stop video or a uh, mic bar. There's a little pause down here in the bottom left-hand corner okay. of my screen. Okay. It's I'm red. Yes. I'm just I'm just curious if yeah okay yeah. So my scroll bar is kind of covering it I think. Gotcha. Um. Okay, so as far as the ability to rust thing, the the best thing to rust stuff is fluorine, and the second best thing to rust stuff is oxygen. But things on the right side of the periodic table, those things are the atoms that can take electrons, and the thing on the left side of the table, the metals, those are the things that gain or that give the electrons to to the nonmetals. Okay, so and we discussed this before. But I feel like it's usually confusing to people, so let's do it again. There's a difference between the oxidizing agent and something that's being oxidized. So what would an oxidizing agent do? What would its purpose be? To oxidize something. To oxidize something, exactly. So what would happen to it? If I was an oxidizing agent, what would be happening to me? If I'm oxidizing some other substance, what's happening to that other substance? It's becoming more negative, right, by taking electrons? You want to think about that again? Wait, no, inverted. I, I'm the oxidizing agent, so what I'm doing is I'm making that substance's charge go up by taking electrons from it. So if I'm the oxidizing agent, what's happening to me? Your charge is becoming more negative. And I, so my charge is being reduced. Yeah. So if I'm trying to oxidize something, I would use something that wants to grab electrons. But if I wanted to reduce something, what would I do? If you wanted to reduce something, would I would use something that's going to do what? You wouldn't use something that would oxidize it, would you? No, I would use something that would oxidize. Not oxidize it, but itself oh, okay. be oxidized. Okay. So like any metal? Not any metal, but Most a metal. So let's say that you had silver that was positively charged, which you don't want, right? That's, that's metal silver that's become um, rusted silver. So you could take that silver and turn that silver back into silver solid with an oxidation state of zero if you gave it an electron what could you use to give it an electron i don't know something you don't care about like what oxygen oxygen ain't going to give electrons to any metals chlorine chlorine's not going to give electrons to any no. metals chlorine non-metals won't give electrons away copper uh copper would work poorly how about something super cheap? How do I know that zinc is super cheap? Because you can get it in a lot of places. You all, you all should know this. Oh, because it's in sunscreen. No, not in, not because it's in sunscreen. What, what else was said? Do you use it in your phone? Like it comes in your phone. Penny. What, what coin? Penny. The penny. So does the penny have a lot of value? No. Which is why we stopped making it out of copper and we started making it out of a much, much cheaper metal, zinc. Mm -hmm. So zinc itself is inexpensive and easy to get our hands on. So if I could take some zinc and use the zinc to give electrons to the silver, then I could get my silver back and I'd have rusted zinc that nobody cares about because zinc's inexpensive. Does that make sense? Good. Is that the metal that the uh, Nobel Prize winner used to re 
like when he dissolves his Nobel Prize, put it on a shelf and then knocks the cancer in it back to the lab, but what metal did he use? He didn't use a metal. He used hydrochloric acid and nitric acid. Those, those two acids in combination with each other at high concentrations are called royal water because they can um, dissolve the um, noble metals, which are gold, silver, and uh, um, copper. Uh, aqueous regia is the other, is like the Latin name for it, which is um, Latin for royal water. Let's look up. What did he use to reverse the process then? What process? Well, How did he get the metal? Oh, what do you think? You should know after what we just talked about. Yeah. He added a. He added a. Okay, he added a substance that gave its electrons away. Like what? What would you add? No. We just had it up there. It's in pennies. Zinc. You just use zinc, elemental zinc. Um, let's see if I can find a picture of it. That might be good. Open this in a new tab. I'm not sure if uh, they haven't done it for a while, but there used to be television shows online or on TV that would show guys going to, say, the Bermuda area, the Caribbean and whatnot, and looking for sunken Spanish galleons. And when they go to pull the gold out, the gold looks like gold. Like, they literally pull it out of the, sh of the ship, and it, it looks exactly like brand new fresh gold, because gold doesn't rust in seawater. But this is what the silver looks like. So initially, you might look at it and go, oh, that's just an old decayed piece of lumber or something like that. And then you touch it, and it's dense and heavy. So what's happened to that silver? It's rusted. So what would you do? You take that silver bar, you put it into like a saltwater solution, an aqueous solution of uh, some kind of electrolyte, and you'd add what to it? Third time we talked about it. Zinc. Zinc. You'd add zinc to it. You throw zinc metal in there, and all of a sudden you'd have silver again. And you'd have rusted zinc, which again, you don't care about because it's super cheap. <laughs> um, yeah, so like OxyClean. What do you think OxyClean's doing? Um, it's oxidizing the... It's an oxidizing agent. So if it's an oxidizing agent, it itself is being reduced because it is going off and oxidizing something. So uh, we have talked about this before when we talked about bleach. But do you remember what happens when you oxidize something that's uh, a dye or actually anything when you oxidize something? What are you trying to do when you use OxyClean in your laundry? Clean uh, stains out of it, remove the color stains. There you go. You're trying to remove the color. Right. So I talked about, I'm pretty sure I talked about a white t-shirt that I had for a long time and then it, it was clean. I bleach it all the time. And then we went to a, a restaurant that had a black light with the, the bouncer guy trying to let us in and my shirt looked like it was camo. So under regular light, it was white, but obviously all the bleach was doing was oxidizing the, the multiple stains that I had had on this shirt. So the color was removed under visible light, but under UV, you could still see that a portion of the dye was still attached to the shirt. So OxyClean and those Oxy substances, they're really out there just trying to steal electrons away from stuff. So does that make sense why OxyClean and or bleach, which is an oxidizing agent, are good at killing things? If you steal an electron off of an atom that's a cell membrane for coronavirus, the coronavirus dies immediately the cell membrane spills out and now that thing is non-functioning and dead. You'd still be able to detect the RNA from it, but that thing can't do any more harm as is. Okay, so let's talk about this associated with spontaneity. So again, 
something that's spontaneous will react with no outside influence or will continue to react after a, a small outside influence has been um, been initiated. So burning a piece of paper, if you light the piece of paper on fire, you take the match away, the paper keeps burning. So again, spontaneous. So electrochemical reactions can be used. We can use the spontaneity to uh, use electrochemical reactions to do stuff for us. So we, we set up or engineer a system that allows a spontaneous reaction to occur in a way that allows us to utilize the energy given off by that. So the delta H that is, is uh, dumped during the course of this reaction is utilized to do something. So it's utilized to like make this phone turn on. It's utilized to, uh, do I have anything else in here that's on a battery? To make that wall clock work. So the electrons are gonna be transferred from one substance to the other, but before they make it to that other substance, we make it do something. Does that make sense? So uh, if, if your friend goes out to run errands or your, you go out to run an errand, you know, if you could leave your house and uh, somebody says, hey, while you're out, can you grab this? So you were gonna you're gonna take that same route anyway, but somebody's having you do something extra along the way, and that's the way it works for electrons. The electron was gonna go from the lead to the sulfur, but instead of just making a straight path from the lead to the sulfur, you made it go through your starter motor to get the car to start. And so that's all we're doing with the electrons. We're passing the electron from the lithium through the display on our cell phone to go to the inorganic or the organic material on the other side. It was going there anyway, but now we're making it uh, do something along the way. So some super common names for batteries, obviously the lithium ion one is super common because we all use it for stuff. Most, uh, most electronic devices using these lithium ion batteries. Lead acid battery, that's the battery that is in your car to start that. Nickel cadmium, that gets used a lot. Uh, nickel cadmium is what the Prius and the Toyota hybrid cars use there. They don't use lithium. The uh, lithium technology hadn't been developed well when the Prius came out, but the nickel cadmium technology was very, um, had been around for quite some time. So they just built really good nickel cadmium batteries and use those in their cars. Um, Aren't those really heavy? They are really heavy, but what kind of mileage does a Prius get? 50, something? 50 to 60 miles per gallon. And if you're in the city, it's closer to 60, close on the 60 end. So what does the Prius sacrifice because the batteries are so heavy? Uh, efficiency. Oh. Range? Well, maybe efficiency. I guess it depends on what you mean by efficiency. How about size? How many people can you cram into a Prius? Right. How many groceries can you put in there? How many bags of, of uh, chicken feed can you put in a Prius? Not, not so many, is right? Why, is that why they're so small? Because the battery is just too heavy? Mm, that's a reason. But one of the reasons is they want the car to be light, so it, uh, it travels farther on the charge, for sure. I'm, I'm not sure exactly how big the Tesla truck is going to be, but it looks like a medium-sized truck. And, um, What's it? So I don't know. I'm sorry, what? What's a good number for miles per gallon? Um, over 30. Oh, okay. Like a hybrid would be over, th would be over 30. Um, like a big diesel truck is probably getting between 15 and 20. Um, a, a bad shaped car, like a Honda Element, looking at like 22, 24. Okay. Even if they're small, minivan. Get what three? What? Fully loaded semis, older ones get what one to three miles per gallon. Yeah, not 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 much. Yeah, um, but they load up on like they get a bunch of gas each time. Hundred gallons, fifty on each side usually. Okay. Um, so the way that Gibbs free energy is directly translated into batteries is by talking about the activity level of different metals. 
So the activity level is easy to see if you put it into something called the series. And so here's an activity series. How do I make this smaller? There we go. One more time. Okay. So what the activity series is, is I've listed atoms in an order that would tell me which atoms electrons are most likely to be removed and which atoms would give electrons to other metals. So the elements at the top of this list are the most active, meaning they give their electrons away um, vigorously and the metals at the bottom don't give their electrons away. So if I wanted to build a battery out of metals, what I would do is I would choose one metal and I would choose another metal and the, the active metal during discharge would give its electrons to the less active metal. And then when during charging, the less active metal would give its electrons back to the active metal. So we talked about nickel cadmium. And so there's nickel and cadmium right in the middle of the chart right here. So which one of these is the, um, is the atom that gets oxidized during discharge and which one is reduced during discharge? Uh, is cadmium reduced? No. The one on the top is the one that gives its electrons away more easily. Okay. So, so, then that would be the so the cadmium is the one that's oxidized because it's giving its electrons away. And the nickel, as nickel plus, so the nickel on the other side would be in this state, nickel with a plus two charge. And the cadmium would look like this. And during the course of the reaction, it would jump over, turn into cadmium plus two and two electrons. Those two electrons would go to the nickel and turn it back into nickel metal. And then during the, the charging process, you would, you would force the nickel to give its electrons up back to the cadmium and you'd end up with cadmium and nickel plus two. So cadmium is the oxidizing agent? Or nickel is the oxidizing agent? Nickel is the oxidizing agent because it's taking electrons from the cadmium during discharge. Okay. What would be a um, the the best battery you could make, like theoretically? Lithium gold. Lithium and gold, right? You'd have the largest. We haven't talked about this, but we will in a bit. Largest voltage differential, and if lithium wants to give its electrons away the most, and gold wants to keep its electrons the most, if I was a gold atom and I lost my electrons, tell me what I'm trying to do. Rip it from lithium. Well, just I'm trying to get an electron back. That's my goal. So if something is willing to give me an electron, I, I would give you energy to give me my electron back. And we'll see that when we, when we look at another chart. But it's uh, 3.30, so six minutes. Everybody stand up, walk around in a circle or something, because you have to. Otherwise, you won't remember any of this. Go outside. I'm going to go outside for six minutes. Go. Okay. It's so warm outside. Ugh. Ugh. I hate it. Nothing but like weed yesterday. Like I clean so much. Okay. So my old bed frame was like rotting and 
just bad. It was bad. And so we took the mattress and stuff off and then we ripped apart the bedroom. And so now it's just like my mattress riser and my new mattress, but my room is like sparkling clean and it's so nice. <sighs> but I haven't done any homework this week. <laughs> it's only Tuesday. You might say that, but then it'll be only Thursday. Listen, Sheen, okay, I'm not taking like 15 classes. I'm just taking 10 and fight. It would have taken more classes if I would have known that quarantine was happening. Which site class? Uh, site 202A. Okay. It's just the second part of general psych. Is that with Zip? Yeah, it's with Professor Grimmel. He's crazy. He's, he's weird. Based on what I've seen of him, he is thoroughly enjoyable. He's enjoyable, but he uh, uh, he he can be kind of awkward sometimes and say some weird stuff, you know. But is I mean, not the most enjoyable part about him, though. Is it? Is it? I don't know. I don't think. So. I think the most enjoyable part about him is that he's just really like down to earth and he's super close to his students, which is like pretty cool. His good students. He's super close to his good students. I think he used to be my dad's high school horticulture teacher. Mm. Madeline, what kind of coffee is that? The good kind. The good <laughs> What'd you put in it? Cinnamon, nutmeg, cloves, and Swiss mix. Shit. <laughs> that sounds fancy. It's hard. I, I spent way too much like going out to get coffee every single single day of my life since I was like fourteen, so I really had to figure something out. Yeah. It can, uh, can rack up a lot of money. I had a time in my life whenever I was working at a cafe where I just got Dutch Bros like every day. And not only me, I got me and my friends Dutch Bros every day. <laughs> I had no idea what money was. I was like, yeah, let's get coffee. It doesn't matter. It's fine. And now I'm like, hey, can I have like $5 maybe? That's kind of me with reptiles. Like I once didn't pay for phone bill for three months just so that I could buy it. What? What do you want from me? Okay, priorities. Daddy, Life is short. Daddy, you don't need so many reptiles. Hey, half of them were taken away because my boyfriend and I broke up and he was like, let's split oh. the kids. And I was like, oh. More reptiles. You can, More reptiles. Too, you can never have too many. Look, it gets expensive. It gets really expensive. My so one of gotta, my kids. We just gotta, you know, a cheap way to feed him. We just gotta get some people. No, no, I would so never feed up, my reptiles. Up a little bit. That's horrible! I would never feed my reptiles human flesh. That's horrible. I have a pretty solid dubia roach colony going. If you ever need like sacrifices, there you go. Yeah, I, I, keep I'm to, I keep asking my mom, I'm like, hey, maybe maybe Felix would like some dubia roaches, and she's like, no, I don't want any roaches in my house. They can't sustain themselves outside of like 75 degree weather. Yeah, they will die. Percent humidity. Yeah, they'll die. Pissing cockroaches, on the other hand, I uh, lost one of the ones that my biology teacher gave me in my house. And I oh. was like two weeks later, just like chilling on my kitchen counter, like staring at me. And I was like, <laughs> Nice. Like, how'd they get out? I thought you put them in your coffee cup. I had them in my coffee cup, but this was like way after that. I tried to like gut load them on squash before I fed them to anything because I didn't know what their diet with Emily was, so I just wanted to be safe. And I forgot that they can climb on the walls of their enclosures, unlike oh. um, doobie roaches. And usually when I like pull out my cockroach thing to go feed spiders, like I just flip it open and just start grabbing and I just forgot to close it. Oh my god, Maddie. Uh, well, literally the other day, my one of my good friends, my other good lizard friend, was like, "No, don't start buying a bunch of lizards. We can't afford that." But I was, and I was like, "But, but chameleons, <laughs> dude, get on Craigslist. I Craigslist shop, or at least Craigslist window shop, like every single day, and they have right now posted today a baby veiled chameleon." I can't, my mom won't let me get lizards. That I can't afford. Sketchy. 
I can't afford another terrarium. No, lizard lizard sellers are never sketchy. Anyways, I can't afford another terrarium and more substrate and a thing a thing for him to climb on, you know, and more food and another food bin. I, I can't. That's oh. totally fair. I just kind of avoid my responsibilities in favor of reptiles, so that's kind right. of you know, May, that kind of reminds me of, um, you, you saw that video I sent you, right? You get herping, or go herping guy? And that guy. But oh also God. the, the, the mass, mass club soap scrubs. Dude, go herping is one of my Remember that? favorite, <laughs> one of my favorite lizard YouTubers, he's so funny. Oh my God. He's pretty he, awesome. he makes fun of his lizards, it's great. I've seen them all. He, he really just, like, he helps me a lot to figure out, like, how to keep my wizard safe and healthy, you know? I hope he just insults them all the time. Yeah, he's like, this is my bearded dragon. He's, he's really dumb. stupid. He's super Look, dumb. He's hobbing. He doesn't do anything else. He's so dumb. He's just, he, I think he might be staring into the other dimension, but who knows? <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Okay. Let's get back to this. Um, Colleen, I'm just seeing your your chat question about can you see oxidation um yeah sure i mean you've seen a piece of paper burning so you've seen oxidation you can see oxidation in metals if it happens quickly you saw oxidation in metals last quarter when you dropped a uh a piece of zinc metal into i think six molar hydrochloric acid it bubbled pretty violently, and you put the wood splint in, and it whistled. I'm not sure if she's even here, but everybody else heard that. Almost everybody, at least. Okay, so um, is there something on this list? That doesn't look like it belongs on this list. Uh, hydrogen. Yeah. What What is hydrogen doing on this list? Not being a metal. Anything else? Uh, I mean, doesn't hydrogen usually give its electrons? It's showing you that all of these metals above hydrogen are more active than hydrogen. Meaning, if you drop nickel into an acid, what happens to it? it uh dissolves it dissolves because an acid from last quarter or from last set of notes means an h plus right yeah. so if i dropped nickel in well um, that's fine if i drop nickel in the nickel's oxidation state is zero and because it's more active than the hydrogen the nickel gives its electrons to the hydrogen produces hydrogen gas and then makes nickel plus two charge so you're dissolving the nickel metal. When you guys did that in lab, you had zinc solid. It fell into some hydrochloric acid, which is H pluses, and you ended up with hydrogen gas that caught on fire. And then your zinc dissolved into zinc plus two aqueous. So anything above hydrogen will dissolve in an acid. So what does that say about the things below it? They will not dissolve in an acid, which makes sense. So why? I mean, it, does it make sense why those are the things that we make jewelry out of and coins out of? Because mm -hmm. if I made a coin and then if it touched ketchup and dissolved, you'd be kind of irritated, right? Yes. Or if uh, if you spilled some Coke and it dissolved your money. That'd be a bad thing, right? Yeah, definitely. Rest in peace, Rest in peace my penny. <sighs> yeah. I don't know why we're still rolling with pennies. I smell penny. I smell penny. Maybe we can use the pandemic to get rid of pennies. Mm. Have an other pennies country corona on them. cut out the penny and just adjust to their economies to the next nickel and like no negatives just happen. Penny negatives. <laughs> But then you'd force regular Americans to do math. Penny demic is amazing. That that should be what the laws said. The penny demic, the way to get rid of pennies. 
God forbid, American Dumas though, or anything. I mean, honestly, do we need coins? But Kovacic, we can't do it in the rounds without pennies. Well, I mean, obviously, obviously, I could come up with some copper. I mean, I like collecting coins, so I'd be, I'd be out of that hobby. No, it would be, it would be more important because they'd be less abundant. Yeah, it's It'd not like rich. they would. Yeah, exactly. It's not like they would just get rid of every single penny. They just stop producing them. Ban all coins. Ban, ban all coins. I mean, a lot of other countries have already gotten rid of their cents, like a lot of your, a lot of European countries. It'd be nice they, if they I don't have cents anymore. They, they just have the, their equivalent of a dollar. The parking meter thing, um, that, that's disappearing. Like the actual coin operated parking meter is going to disappear. Yeah. The, uh, cards now. Yeah. Well, the other thing that they do, like in Portland, is you can just, um, there's a, you just take a picture of the spot that you're in with an app and it charges you. However, you take a picture of it when you're there and then when you leave and then you get charged for that. That's it. So, but how do the, the guys who like control the cards, how do they know that you have paid for that? They won't need to. They can just cross reference. It doesn't matter. You, if you, uh, oh, I see what you're saying. Well, if yeah. the person rolls up and goes to walk past your car, and uh, I mean, they would probably have like GPS in their little device, and it would say, yes, this car right here in this spot has, you know, logged into the app kind of situation. Okay. Um, but I mean, they have the other meters that are downtown, right? You just put your your money, your card in, and or your mm -hmm. money in, and then uh, it gives you a little receipt you put in the window, obviously. Um, where are we talking about that? I lost my train of thought. Uh, getting rid of coins. Oh, getting rid of coins. Okay. Getting rid of all physical currency. Um, <laughs> maybe yeah. at some point. That would make crime harder. It would make bad crime harder. It would make advanced crime. It would make taxes so much easier. Bitcoin. Maybe. Ew, bro. No. <laughs> Stuff like that. I always remember do, saying, do, um, we want, do we want to talk about why the Great Depression was started? <laughs> um. <laughs> Just like, inflation, the depreciation. We're in the roaring 20s. I mean, it's yeah, the roaring 20s. We got illnesses, topic. and we got depression, and we got war. Right? Woo! Yeah, we have war. Oh, yeah, we have war. What are you on about? What, um, what did Trump say this week that reminded, that should remind you of Ferris Bueller's Day Off? You know, I, I every time he says something, I just, I just go blank. Like, I don't even. In Ferris Bueller's Day Off, they're talking about what happened during the Great Depression when they raised tariffs. The, <laughs> and he talked about raising tariffs with unemployment approaching 20%. Tariffs are like trading, right? But of course, he wouldn't have read any of that kind of stuff. But yeah, maybe he watched Ferris Bueller's Day Off and we could get him to look at like here's a clip of Ben Stein informing a group of students. Doesn't doesn't matter if they were fake students. He was a fake teacher, and that uh, Ben Stein's not a good person. But whatever. <clears throat> so what else we got here? We uh, so the elements on the higher on the list will give electrons to the elements lower on the list, and so the situation for a battery is. Wait, so would lithium give potassium? Yep. Um, okay. So if I'm metal, I'm metal X, and there I'm in a solution, in a in a electrolytic solution. Um so you drop metal X and metal Y into Gatorade and metal X needs electrons and metal Y has electrons, under what set of circumstances would Y give its electrons to X? When does this happen? If it's higher up on the list of them. Um... 
That's it. Y will only give its electrons to X if Y is higher on the list, period. Otherwise, what we're talking about is gold has its electrons, and I put it into a container, and in that container, I have rusted iron. Is gold going to give its electrons to the rusted iron so the iron can't be isn't rusted anymore? No. No. But what if I had rusted gold? Sorry, rusted gold. And I put iron in a container in, of Gatorade with the rusted gold. What would happen? The rust would dissolve. The iron would give its electrons and it itself would become rusted and the gold would turn back into regular elemental gold. Okay? okay. So you've got several situations. Sorry. Real quick. Yeah. What does rusted gold even look like? And would that, in that case, be a violent Pickle gold? Because the difference on gold. The... Uh, it wouldn't be. It wouldn't really be that, that violent. Um, it would be gold it, it's... oxide. It probably is just black and or gray. It just kind of looks like copper. Yeah, it looks like copper. It looks like rust, pretty much. Looks cool. Weird. Uh, tell me about this. Can you give me an interesting property of this rust? It would be very heavy. Oh, oh yeah, because it's all it lost gold. were electrons. So it's still gold atoms there. And now it's gold atoms connected to oxygen atoms. So it's real heavy. So if you had like one thing of gold and one thing of gold of the same exact weight, but then one of them rusted, would it be like twice as heavy? It would gain weight for sure. Like if you had a piece of, of just iron and it rusted and you held on to all of the rust, that stuff would have more mass than the iron would by itself because you just pulled oxygens out of the air and attached it to it. You could do the math on how much weight it would gain just you know, about atomic mass. That sounds like a great exam question. Uh, <laughs> sheen. It's okay, it's already an exam question. Okay. Okay, so we talked about that, talked about that, talked about that, talked about that. Okay, so let's talk about the first batteries. Few, zoom, zoom. So the first batteries were either called voltaic cells or galvanic cells, depending on what part of Europe you lived in. And um, this, this, the design is basically, I've got a couple of containers and I've got some metals and then I let them touch each other. So this is a really bad battery, but um, it, it serves our purpose, it doesn't really matter. So on the left, I've got a, a bar of solid copper and that's gonna be called the anode because it's gonna be connected to a bar of solid silver and that's gonna be called the cathode. The anode is where the electrons come from and the cathode is where the electrons are going to. So why is the copper the place where the electrons are coming from? Well, whoa. Whoa, whoa. That's supposed to be turned off. Is that blue line on the diagram a, um, a wire? Yes. So um, copper, copper is here and silver is down here. So copper is more active than silver is. So if one of those two were gonna give electrons to the other spontaneously, the copper would give the electrons to the silver. All right, so let's, let's come back down here. So the only way this works is if in this container here on the right, there are silver ions, okay? So that's why it says silver nitrate solution. And over here, there's a copper nitrate solution, which is why this is, well, copper two nitrate, which is why this is um, light blue colored. So, hey, hey, you can't talk in here. Quiet or out? Those are your choices. 
and quiet. All right? Okay. So there's an ion of silver floating around aqueous in the water. And this silver ion has lost its electron and it would like to get its electron back. So this is an aqueous solution here. So this solution on the right is, is an electrolyte solution. This solution is an electrolyte solution. So basically this liquid is a conductor. So what I need to do is get an electron to attach itself to that copper, or that, sorry, that silver. So this is conductive. The, co the silver bar is very conductive. This blue wire is conductive and I've got this copper bar. So this copper atom, this copper atom right here says, okay, take electrons. So the electron leaves, goes down the wire, goes to this bar, and the electron is sitting right here. And the silver says, hey, there's a negative charge and attaches itself to the bar because now it's turned itself into actual elemental silver. But what happened to this little copper atom that was right here? it left, it's not copper element anymore, it's copper with a plus two charge, and this is aqueous, becomes aqueous. So tell me what's happening to, to this bar of copper. It's uh, corroding. It's corroding away, it's dissolving away. And what's happening to this bar of silver? It's uh, getting, gaining silver? It's getting bigger. More silver is being attached to it. Does that make sense? Wow. Because there is silver ion in the solution. Remember? There is a uh, silver plus here, and then it attached itself when the, the electron from the copper came over. You okay with that? Anybody want to point something out with this reaction? I was going to ask, why do we need the salt bridge? Okay, anything else that we've talked about so far? Nothing. You guys are totally fine with everything that's happened so far. Um, you should be asking me, that's copper plus two, and that's silver plus one. Where did the other electron go? This reaction will only happen if you have two silvers that need one electron each. So this copper jumps into the solution, becomes copper plus two two electrons get sent over to the other side. One goes to this, one goes to that one, and this becomes two atoms larger of silver. This becomes one atom smaller of copper. So this bar is slowly dissolving away. This bar is slowly building up. So how could this battery go dead? If the copper is completely corroded? Yeah, the moment all of this copper bar is out of the solution, all right, I have no more electrons to send over. What's the other way? There's no more silver ions in the uh, other solution. There's no more a a AG pluses to take those electrons, so the reaction stops. So either all of this dissolved silver disappears or this copper bar disappears. Um, so let's talk about what Annika wants to talk about, which is the salt bridge. The salt bridge is basically just a tube. It looks like a, a test tube, a small test tube. It's got cotton in the mouth of both of the tubes. And inside of this is some kind of salt water solution. In this case, it's a potassium nitrate solution, okay? So during the course of the discharge of this battery, two electrons get sent out of the copper side. So what should happen to the charge of this whole beaker? It, uh, it becomes more positive. It, it goes up morning. plus two, that's not allowed. So how does the battery compensate for that? Two yeah. nit in this case, the salt bridge sends two nitrates in. So two pluses leave, two negatives come in to take the place. So what's happening over here? Two electrons just entered this side of the beaker. So how does the battery neutralize the fact that this side over here became negative two? It sends in two potassium ions to cancel that out. So the salt bridge neutralizes the charge differential. You okay with that? At any point in time, do the um, spare nitrate ions go into the salt bridge from the ion? 
Yeah, I'm also just pushing. Do these nitrates here end up into the salt bridge? Yeah. Uh, it's possible. Not, probably not very likely because they'd be the furthest ion, negative ions away from the positive. So, but I guess it's possible because they're in direct contact with each other. Plus, you usually, to do this, you usually stuff the mouths with cotton so it, uh, it doesn't allow for a lot of flow. Um, all right, so you can draw this in a way that um, that you don't have to, to make this entire apparatus. And uh, this is what you, you write. So you say copper solid, you separate it by a line, and then you say copper solid turned into copper ion aqueous. The double line is the salt bridge. And then I started with silver aqueous and that silver aqueous turned into silver solid. So what we're doing is we're taking the electrons from the copper and giving them to the silver. And this is the reaction that occurs. Copper becomes copper ion and two electrons and silver ion plus an electron, these electrons turn into silver solid. The reaction would look like this two silver ions because I need to take care of the two electrons that each copper gives up. We okay with that? So from this thing here, you should be able to draw this guy up here and vice versa. Okay. So has anybody ever seen one of these? Maybe one of you in like an experimental setting. Anybody have any of these at their house doing any actual operating of a device? I think I have a really old dried up one somewhere in my shop. All your batteries look like this thing here, right? Not all of them, but the ones that you usually put your hands on look like this, of varying sizes and thicknesses and lengths. The other common one is the one that's in that rectangular block, which is the nine volt battery. And then the rest of the batteries in your, uh, in your life exist in what form? In our phones. Some sort of protect, um, um, why am I not saying the word? Pro protery, uh, priority, um, I'm having a brain stroke here proprietary um in some sort of proprietary form so if each of us disassembled our phones and pulled the batteries out they're all going to look a little bit different they're all going to be thin um flat boxy shapes but uh, they're all going to have little their own little idiosyncrasies different lengths different widths and that's because uh the cell phone companies hose us over right about four years ago, what did they do to hose us over this time? I'm not sure if Isaac is answering the question or just singing out loud to himself. Maybe singing out loud to himself. He could be reading because that's what I do sometimes when I read I move my mouth. It took away our removable batteries. It took away our ability to remove the battery. Yeah. Yeah, I was wondering about that because in Samsung phones and or in old Samsung phones, I used to be able to like whenever you drop it on the ground, it would like come apart and the battery would be on the ground with the back of the phone. Yep. And the nice thing about that is usually that's the first thing to go on the back in the phone. Um, and now, like we've got an old Pixel One, and I thought, and I know the battery was, I mean, it charged up and then it lasted like twenty minutes. So obviously that's a problem after I've reset it and everything. So I bought a battery online and had it sent to me. And then I realized I can't disassemble this. You need like a, like a heat gun, um, yeah. some plastic, some, some uh, firm plastic like wedges 
And uh, when I watch the video on it, I'm just like, I'm not doing that. That's not not happening. Because I'm sure if I if I use the heat gun on this, I would fry the electronics. But uh, there are people who definitely know how to do this. And I would have seen them, except I can't go to Portland right now. So um, you need to be able to micro solder as well to replace the battery. Yeah, this one this one wasn't a micro solder one, but yeah, to and to micro solder you need like a stereo scope and uh, um, I can't remember what those things, but basically like robot arms to make sure that you hit the right spot. Okay, so the batteries that we're looking at, uh, this one here on the screen, is called a dry cell battery. It's a little bit of a misnomer because it does have moisture inside of it. Uh, it can't operate unless it's wet. So the battery itself is damp. If you were to crack open like a, a C or a double A or a triple A or something like that, the paper that's inside of there would be a little bit damp and that acts as the electrolyte and acts as the salt bridge all at once. So what we have here is, this is actually a piece of graphite. That right there is literally just carbon in its graphite form. So what was the first battery used for? Mm, you know? well, shocking you know, like people. <laughs> the first batteries were used for experiment. That's it. They weren't used to like run a device or anything like that. And if you're asking about what the first battery is to be used in like a consumer electronic device, my guess is the car. But I don't know okay. that for sure. When, I mean, it makes sense. Um, how, so is that like the classic battery that we put in our remote? Is that more old or? Okay. Um, this battery, sorry, Gasner developed this design here. Are you using something that looks like this? Does it yeah. seem like maybe since 1888, we probably should have come up with something better? Yeah. Yeah, we haven't. We haven't? We haven't been able to sell it to the consumer. We'll talk a little bit about consumer idiocy probably next class. But um, yeah, we're, we're still rolling with this. So Century later, we're just like, yeah, it's fine, it's whatever. Right, so I've got this piece of graphite in the middle. So can you give me some properties of graphite? It's a good conductor. Obviously, what else we got? It's in pencils. It's in pencils, okay. So is it structurally sound? Uh, depending on the width, because I can break this pretty easily, but I feel like if it were thicker, it would be harder to break. Barely. Barely harder to break. I mean, yeah, I mean... You can crack open a double A AA or a triple A battery with just like a couple of pairs of needle nose pliers and take the graphite stick out in the middle and break it like chalk. Like, yeah. there's nothing to it. So can you see that being a problem? Well, yeah, it would, over time, it would get super corroded. Well, not, I don't care about that, but what if I dropped the battery? What would happen, what could happen right here? It would crack. Break. break it in half, battery doesn't work yeah. anymore. Yeah. So it's not super structurally sound. Um, and then I've got this zinc anode, which is an internal can. Again, if you were to crack it open, you have a can of metal, and inside of that you have another can of metal. Inside of that you have some paper, and inside of that you've got a, uh, a graphite rod. So the zinc, what do we say zinc's good for? Corroding stuff? Yeah. So Is there, on the diagram, it looks like there's a gap of space. Is that supposed to be there? No. There's no there's no gap of space. Right above the paper. Yeah, there's no gap. There's no okay. Mm -mm. You mean like here? Exploding, hold on. Yeah. Yeah, no, no. No space. Okay. So electrons come out of the bottom. I need to choose a different color. Come out of the bottom. and then go up to the top. And what do we put right here? Some form of load. 
I don't know. What else do you use double and triple A batteries for? All I can think of is just remotes and uh, controllers, like oh, game sure. controllers. Oh, sure. Sure. Xbox. Nope. Uh, detector. Oh, yeah. Um, um, they use the 9 volt, but that's fine. I don't know why, but my, my first thought was like uh, those baby monitors. Battery power uh, baby monitor? Ours just plugged into the wall. Ours just plugged into the wall. Really? Cool. Walkie talkies. There you go. Sure. Absolutely. I mean, depending on how many you string together, you could do a few other things. Sure. You could start a car with them once. Lanterns. If you had enough of them. Like lanterns. Oh, yeah. Sure. Like little lanterns outside. All right. So, what we do is when the electron comes out the bottom, we shove wires around. So, I shunt the electron to go do something. Right. And then it's allowed to go to the graphite. So how does this battery go dead? We've just used it too much. What well, what happens to the battery itself? Um, the zinc anode can corrodes. So the solution right now first. Well, the other thing is this paper here that's soaked with the aluminum chloride electrolyte can go dry. Which is why if you've got a battery, you've never used it, over the course of time, it will literally just dehydrate. And so the battery won't work after it's lost all of its moisture on the inside. They're sealed fairly well. They can last five, 10 years, but um, they will eventually dry out and then they won't be functional because they won't have an electrolytic solution to pass through. Can you inject liquid back into it to make it work again? Probably. I'd buy another battery. So what's the problem with this, this situation here? Uh, we have to buy more batteries after a while because they keep running out of... It's yeah. super, super wasteful, right? Plus, this is this thing has metal all through it. And we're not doing a good job of recycling our metals. Most people don't even want to touch a battery. They just want to get rid of it. So they end up in landfills. That's, that's really not a good place for something that we spent a lot of time, money, and effort mining out of the ground and refining. When you could just take the battery and mine it back for its stuff. But we're so just- Can we just recycle it? Yeah, but what's the, anybody have any idea with the percentage of batteries that are recycled? Non-lithium batteries? Like five, probably. <laughs> it's under 10%. Okay, well, let me rephrase that. Excluding car batteries, like the ones that are in the lead acid batteries that are in your car to start your car, and lithium ion batteries, you're under 10% for, um, for recycling those batteries. Most of the time, like, do you even know where to go? No, yeah, I was gonna ask you. Like, where do you recycle a AAA battery? <laughs> There's a place in Bend called Battery Plus that they sell batteries and they take batteries. Does anybody know the spot in the gorge you can go? Hood River Hobbies. You can drop batteries off at Hood River Hobbies. They have a good um, they have a good distribution system with the battery people because they sell uh, one of their big um, selling items are RC cars. So they purchase a lot of batteries. So they'll just take all of your your batteries and then send them back to their recycle over. And they get a tiny credit for it, so you should do it. Plus, it doesn't end up in a landfill, which is the most important part. Will they take them if the carbon... Uh... Yeah, they don't care. All that stuff's going to get torn apart anyway, so it doesn't really matter. So Gasner's battery has been around for a long time and people have been trying to improve on the battery. The best improvement we've made in the last 40 years is the lithium ion battery, which really didn't see, see a lot of use until about a dozen years ago. 
before that people were still using nickel cadmium because it was a known technology. Can somebody tell me what's wrong with the lithium ion battery? We had a discussion about this maybe the first week of 121. What happened with it? No, what are, can you tell me, can anybody give me some pros and cons to the lithium ion battery? Really light, high energy density. Okay, so first thing is its density is 0.53 grams per milliliter. That is, that's almost half of what water's density is. So of metals, it's very not dense, meaning you can make a big battery out of it and the thing doesn't weigh, you know, like 70 pounds or something. Like when was the last time you changed the car, the battery under the hood of your car? Who has not done that? Who's not carried one of those batteries? Two of you? They're heavy. They're any, anywhere between like 35 pounds for the small battery that would be in like a small four cylinder car to the one that's in my truck that weighs close to a hundred pounds. And there are two of them in that thing. So, um, and then you can use them like a marine battery. Those things can be upwards of 150 pounds. So there, that's not, not something uh, you wanna be toting around with you as your phone because they're made out of lead. That density is 11 times what water is. So it's 20 times more dense than, than lithium ion. But what's bad about lithium ion batteries? Who remembers the, note, the Galaxy Note phone? Galaxy Note 7. The Galaxy yeah. Note 7 was catching on fire because they're, they did a bad uh, design with the, where the electrodes were in the battery. And yeah, those, those phones are not allowed on airplanes, flat out. The Galaxy Note 7, they look at your phone and they're like, that a Note 7? They laugh at you because who has one? And then they tell you you can't bring it on the phone or on the plane. Or nine, but are, do they still, like, are they still having trouble with that in the higher up series? No, they redesigned how the battery electrodes are engineered. So That's good. they skipped eight altogether so people wouldn't think that it was the bad one. And so they just went straight to nine. Oh, then I guess I do have mine. Okay, so the, um, but what was the problem with it? With the phones exploding? Well, why would the phones explode? Oh, because they were overheating, right? So? The battery couldn't, so the, I'm pretty sure it was that, like, the, the battery just kept overheating because it was taking in, or, like, it couldn't do the Yeah, but who cares effect. if the battery overheats? What's the problem with that? Well, if it gets high enough, then it'll explode. Or if it gets hot enough. Why? Like, you could get your car battery really, really hot. It will never explode. Why? Because it's sturdy enough or big enough? No. Um, you ever seen lithium metal in water? We put that video, that Brainiac video in Chem 121 up. The lithium sputtered on top of water, the potassium and sodium sputtered on top of water and created a flame. The rubidium exploded a bathtub and the cesium blew a bathtub in half. So lithium cannot be put in water. So the electrolyte that you need for the lithium ion batteries is a flammable organic like gasoline. It's not gasoline, but it's like gasoline in that it's a flammable organic. So when that gets hot, and the only reason that it doesn't catch on fire is because it's not exposed to oxygen, but what happens when something gets hot? What can it do? Expand. Expand, and then that tight battery case of plastic cracks open. Oxygen is now exposed to this very hot electrolytic solution that's flammable, and you get a fire. Oh. So uh, the okay. bad thing about lithium ion batteries is the electrolyte is flammable. The great thing about the lead acid battery is the electrolyte is water. That's obviously not going to catch on fire. So um, there's pluses and minuses with the lithium ion batteries, which is why Toyota, even though lithium ion batteries had been around for a while and we knew about the engineering, Toyota didn't want to touch it because they knew when your Prius got into a car accident, and your Prius battery cracked open because you got hit really hard, there will be no fire because of the battery. But as soon as the Tesla came out, 
there were stories about Tesla cars catching on fire for one reason or another. And that is because it was news. Like, look, these batteries catch on fire. You shouldn't buy a Tesla. I mean, it was just sensational. So they, they sold papers and had clickbait because it sounded good. But in actuality, only a couple of them caught on fire. And for the most part, it was user error. But um, so the, the big issue is those batteries have the ability to ignite and other batteries that use water as their electrolyte can't, can't ignite. But, but are you willing to put a lead battery in your phone? No, because it would be heavy. Because it would be heavy. So there you go. Your battery would be safer, it would be bigger, and it would be heavier, and you're just not willing to do that. What kind of batteries do they have in the, like, the brick phones? The ones Nickel that cadmium. Okay. Wasn't it nickel cadmium? Yeah. There were stories of someone, blood, like, people bludgeoning other people to death with those phones. Jesus! She and God! Why did it be so dark? It's true. They were that Just ahead. Because it's true it doesn't mean you have to say it. Now I'm thinking of like people from the 70s being all bloody. These phones. A nice old man. Yeah, he's going to go bludgeon somebody with that phone. Yeah, Shane, thanks a lot. Um, he kind of looks like he would. No, he doesn't. Shut up, dude. 90% of that back where his hand is is battery. The thing is not light. You cannot put that thing in your pocket, right? And it's not because it's got a 10 inch screen. It doesn't have a screen. I, I know, but you can also not put some smartphones in your pocket because they have a 10 inch screen. That's, that's all I'm saying. Mm. Okay. Um, when we have class on Thursday, we'll talk about how to calculate the voltages for these batteries. All right. Have a nice day. Thank you. Yep. Have a good day. Thank you. <laughs> Murder in his eyes. Bye. Stop.